John and I met Thomas Owens at the shelter in a creative writing class. Thomas speaks in Proverbs just naturally and has these bright blue eyes that make you feel both heard and known. <laughs> he has worked for years as a house painter and is incredibly skilled. We connected with Thomas just as we were starting the Community Empowerment Fund, and he got involved with the goal of gaining more stable income through his work. We learned alongside Thomas and came to know, trust, and believe in him. To this day, he remains one of our most incredible mentors, teaching us by example how to balance caution with compassion and action with empathy. Thomas relapsed. He blew hundreds of dollars in a matter of hours and even sold his cell phone, the phone he bought with the microloan he received from CEF. It was July of 2009, halfway through the summer and halfway through CEF pilot's year. And the three of us were facing this breakdown together. Relapse is something that happens and is a part of the process of recovery. And it's something that we knew intellectually that we should expect and be prepared to handle. But as much as we may have acknowledged this as a possibility and even been, ex and even been prepared to step in as a friend, supporter, and advocate, I do not know that we ever could have been ready for that much reality. The very next morning, Maggie and I sat with Thomas in a coffee shop on Franklin Street. He had brought with him a letter, a proposal, a two-part plan for the rest of his recovery. Step one, to not give up. Step two, he wrote, to find a person I can really trust and let them be my accountability partner with this money matter. Just to let someone know what day I'll be paid and find some way to get this money off my hands. It's really a trigger. Sometimes I can handle it. Other times, it's almost the devil itself. So we listened to Thomas, and we gave it a shot. Every week when he would get paid, we would meet up, and I would hold on to any extra cash that he didn't need for the rest of the week. I was his friend and unofficial savings account. These very first savings deposits, the ones that Thomas made, were kept in the safest place that I could imagine in a junior's college, my sock drawer in my room in townhouse apartments just a half mile from here. In just a few months, Thomas saved over several thousand dollars. He saved up enough to move off of the streets and into a place of his own. He bought a work van, insurance, and had more than enough to make ends meet. Thomas was one of five community members that received a microloan from the Community Empowerment Fund, or CEF, that summer. John and I had just finished our junior years at UNC, and CEF was just starting to take shape, shifting from a student group with a summer research project into something much more. After learning alongside Thomas just how incredibly powerful this type of account could be, we decided to shift away from microloans and towards savings. In 2010, CEF, opened, uh, CEF launched our CEF savings accounts, goal-oriented accounts with a 10% match and relationship-based support. You save $1,000, CEF adds $100 on top. Unlike traditional banking services uh, or other exploitive services like uh, check cashers or payday loans, CEF services are completely, completely free. No fees, not ever. And from sock drawer until now, over 500 CEF members have followed Thomas's example and opened up safe savings accounts. Collectively, they've saved over $700,000. That's on average $1,300 per person, four out of five of whom are experiencing homelessness when we first started working together. But what had really hooked me in at this time was not just the Creative Safe Savings Program, but the deep and mutually supportive relationships that advocates clearly had with their members. I was a junior at Duke in 2011 and heard from peers at UNC about members like Donna. Having savings with CEF is definitely a godsend because it gives me the opportunity to save money for things that I couldn't afford. I don't make a lot of money, so do I have millions and thousands of dollars saved? No, but I think I have more money saved than I've ever done in my life. Donna has saved over $9,000. At first to move out of the shelter, and then to build an emergency fund, and for a family trip to Boston, and finally even for Christmas gifts for her grandchildren. Having savings. Over the past seven years, CEF has grown from a start startup student organization into what our partners now call the community's glue, or the one-stop shop. To date, we've been powered by over 1,000 students from UNC, and from Duke. 
and we've even found ways to collaborate in spite of the basketball rivalry. So sometimes that means we fundraise by throwing pies in each other's faces. Like that. <laughs> More importantly, uh, CEF advocates work alongside members to help them accomplish whatever their goals might be, to gain employment, secure housing, to build savings, um, and everything in between. CEF advocates work as connectors, helping members bridge all kinds of sectors to make sure that they can successfully access the resources that they need. Let me share with you a snapshot of last year. In 2016, 260 CF advocates worked side by side with over 1,000 members. 155 of those members found jobs, 105 moved into their own homes, and they together saved over $220,000 in one year. This is Mark. He just signed the lease for his new home, and he, after successfully saving to move out of the shelter, and he's already begun saving towards his next goal, uh, finishing college. And this is Johnny. We've known Johnny for over four years now. Uh, he also first started by saving to move out of the shelter, and now he's saving to pay for his family to be able to immigrate to the US from Nigeria. And finally, for the first time ever, three CEF members have saved enough to purchase their own homes. This is Paige, she's one of those three. Um, she saved enough not only to be able to pay off debts to build up her credit, but enough for the closing costs and down payment and purchased her very first home last year. It's important to mention at this juncture that we are not suggesting that people can save their way out of poverty. CEF and our savings accounts are not standalone solutions to homelessness, but tools that help people to survive. They are tools to prevent housing crises and to more sustainably transition out of homelessness. Looking at the broader picture, you've probably asked yourself just what causes so many people to struggle to sustain housing and wealth. In a 15-minute TED Talk, we can't possibly explain all the complex reasons why people experience homelessness. I'm sorry, we're just not going to be able to deliver on that. But we can at least start to share a glimpse of the underlying problems in our systems that make our members' achievements both astounding and a clarion call for systemic change. First, most financial services are not built to serve low-income households. In fact, they often do more harm than good. In 2015, financially underserved Americans spent approximately $141 billion in fees and interest. Everything from high overdraft fees to exploitative payday loans and check cashing make it more expensive to be poor in this country than to have wealth. For example, when a person does not have a bank account, whether because there are no branches in their neighborhood or because of minimum balance requirements or high overdraft charges or because they simply don't trust banks, that person will spend, on average, $500 a year in extra transaction costs alone. And on top of struggling with a financial system, the housing costs are simply unaffordable for low-wage workers and people living on fixed income. Let's take rentals here in Chapel Hill, for example. If you earn $8 an hour, you would need to work for over 100 hours a week in order to be able to afford a one-bedroom apartment. And to make matters worse, over the last 12 years, federal funding for affordable housing has just gone off a cliff. We are experiencing a rental housing crisis. And underlying the systemic challenges in our housing and financial systems is the pervasive and intersectional issue of the racial wealth gap. Throughout our country's history, banking and housing have been two of the many vectors through which racism has been enacted institutionally and intentionally. On average, the wealth in a household of color is $100,000 less than that of a white household. For black and Latinx households, that translates to owning just six and seven cents for every one dollar owned by a white household. One contributor to the racial wealth gap in the U.S. has been home ownership. Homeownership is the primary way in the U.S. that families pass down wealth from generation to generation. Beginning in the 1930s, the Federal Housing Administration wrote racism into the lending manuals, literally. Called redlining, the federal government used this system and policy to rank neighborhoods based on race and ethnicity to determine which neighborhoods were fit for financial investments. Looking at this map of Durham in 1937, we can see how the Federal Housing Administration divided up neighborhoods by their racial makeup. 
red for neighborhoods of color considered risky, and green for the white suburbs that they considered desirable. And by drawing those red lines, the federal government explicitly refused to make loans in non-white majority black neighborhoods. This was then adopted by banks and insurance companies. And these policies of denying mortgages and opportunities to neighborhoods of color stayed on the books until the Civil Rights Act of 1968. And while this might sound like ancient history to you, wealth is a generational word. For a black family that was denied the opportunity for a subsidized loan in the 30s or the 60s, their family might not have the wealth to become a homeowner today. And in many cities across the US, banks continue in the present day to use uh, discriminatory lending practices based on racial segregation lines. So the practice did not pass away with the policy. And truthfully, we haven't even begun to scratch the surface. Go home tonight and Google the ever-growing gap. Or check out the work that a local group called Spirit House has done to map the effects of redlining on Durham's neighborhoods today and asking the question of what it means to be part of a community that is constantly experiencing unmitigated disaster. So where do these problems leave us? According to a survey done by the FDIC in 2016, almost half of US households cannot come up with $400 without drawing on drawing on credit, borrowing money, or selling their possessions. So maybe earlier when we said that the average amount that CEF members save is $1,300, maybe that didn't sound like a whole lot right then, but these homeless and formerly homeless individuals have built more in savings than almost half of the people in the United States. So together, CEF members and advocates, we've built something, we've found something that helps people to, to afford housing, to build savings, and to find some stability. We've hacked it to make it work just a little bit better. Our savings accounts are a survival tool for people living in a system that was not built to serve them. There is another important reason for why this works, though. The only reason people trust us with their money is because we're working together, flexibly, holistically, and within the context of greater relationships and belonging. We weave in the financial aspects as we go, but we support people more broadly as a whole person. We work side by side with each other, and advocates are not experts in the issues, but learning with members along the way. It's hands on, roll up your sleeves, get it done. So when someone comes to CEF because they just saw a now hiring sign, and they want a resume to apply, we'll help them make that resume, and we'll help them apply for that job. Then when they need a cell phone to stay in touch about the interview, or a bus pass to make it to the job, or a photo ID just to start work, we're working with them through all those steps too. We're there with we're there when they deposit their first check and when they move into their new home. So this, this is what we do at CEF. But what we do is, and what we do is really, really important. But just as important is how we do it and how it makes people feel. CEF is one of the programs that remind you of what's good in life and what's worth fighting for. It's about making that connection, touching hands touching lives. For me, it was like to learn how to live again, learn how to live without drugs or any kind of addictions. It changed the way I do my money, the way I deal with it. I respect it more. <laughs> That's what I learned from CEF. When they turn someone's life around like mine, it's not just me, but it's my whole family, my children, my grandchildren that know me now that didn't before. When people make such a difference in your life, it's just, you know, it's love. I, I, I can't put it any other way. And it's shown in many ways, not just with funds. So, and I'm gonna get teary-eyed. So, um, we're family, and that's what CEF puts in your heart, your family, and you found somewhere you belong. I see lives change, and if I can see it from where I come from, I know somebody else can see it. Not only see it, probably feel it. So thank you. So truthfully, CF is really about the first word in our name, community. Something much more fundamental to all of us. It's about our foundation, our ability to connect and to collectively achieve these more tangible outcomes, like jobs and savings and homes. And if you want to know where the magic of CEF lives, the stuff that makes this funny place work, 
It's in the relationships and then the belonging that we find with one another. It's members pooling their money to buy a birthday gift for an advocate, or members organizing a yard sale to raise money for CEF. And it's a ginormous gaggle of students and church volunteers that answered a last minute call this past winter break to move a member into his new home, and then writing a cheesy poem about it. It's everybody spontaneously dancing the wobble together. <laughs> Cry maybe even about the wobble. <laughs> <laughs> It's everybody spontaneously dancing the wobble together at our parties, which happens every year. It's a member who's currently staying at the shelter, creating a quilting group to meet weekly at our office, buying all of the fabric and sewing supplies himself, and using quilting to spread love and togetherness. It's a member asking for a sleeping bag, not for himself, but for one of the eight other homeless individuals that he's helping to shelter in his camp in the woods. It's when I overhear a conversation between three CEF members in our lobby <clears throat> talking about how they all pray, oh gosh, sorry, <laughs> for CEF and all the people here every single day. It's about belonging to a place, to one another, to community. Hopefully, after hearing all of this, you want in. We're calling on you to take action today, and here are a couple of ways you can get started. First, visit CF's website and, and sign up for a newsletter to learn more about ways to get involved. Second, move your money. By joining a community development credit union, your money can be owned and invested locally. And third, find, follow, and join forces with groups advocating for affordable housing in your community. Locally, we've been inspired by groups like the Orange County Affordable Ho Housing Coalition and the Durham Coalition for Affordable Housing and Transit. Learn more about how you can show up and speak out for affordable housing. It matters, now more than ever. There are tons of creative ways that you can be involved in advocating for change. One of our favorite ways has been singing with the CEF Advocacy Choir this past year. The choir is a group of members, advocates, and friends that have come together to sing about the need for affordable housing in Orange County. Our choir director, Yvette Matthews, wrote a song just for this occasion. It's one that we hope will get stuck in your hearts and minds and that you will carry with you as a reminder to stand up, to speak out, to write, to dance, to draw, to sing, to do whatever you do to advocate for change in your communities. Now, to close out our talk, please join me in welcoming the CEF Advocacy Choir. I dedicate this song to recession. Yes. Depression. Yes. Unemployment. Yes. This song's for you. Today's a new day. I moved into my house. Nothing but love in my heart, and I got to be starting. I'm all right. Today's a new day. Smile, smile, it's so hard to look 
up when you've been down. Sure would hate to see you give up now. You look so much better when you smile. So smile. Oh, oh, oh. I'm home, I'm in my house. Oh, oh, oh. I'm home, I'm in my house. Oh, oh, oh. I'm home, I'm in my house. Oh, oh, oh. I'm home, I'm in my house. I used to sleep in shelters and on the streets. Now I'm thankful that I have a key. Smile, even though I used to smile. I know God is working, so I smile. Even though I've been here for a while, I smile. Smile, it's so hard to look up when you've been down. Smile, so smile, today's a new day. <laughs>